Hello and once again, welcome back to Amazing Discoveries. My name is Cast Pastor Cameron DeVazier and we're looking at a series entitled Acts 101, a basic overview of the issues and challenges faced by the early Christian church. Where we left off last time was at the First Jerusalem Council, various factions were debating the issue of circumcision and whether it was a requirement for the new Gentile converts to receive that Jewish custom. And as we saw through an extensive study of the Word of God and the spirit of prophecy that this Holy Spirit intervened, he made his decision, and the people came in harmony with his leading. It was a powerful experience, one that has great application for our lives today. And if the book of Acts had ended at the end of Acts chapter 15, you could get the impression that everything was smooth sailing from then on out. That the Holy Spirit was the true leader, men were following in lockstep his leading, and the word of God was preached with boldness. But, in this last message, I want to look at something more difficult, and that is the second Jerusalem council. But before we begin this study, as we do always, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for yet another opportunity to spend time together. And bless this time now as we spend it in your word. We ask that the author of Scripture be our instructor today. Teach us from the pages of inspiration and give us application through the power of your Holy Spirit that we may be your representatives as we seek to hasten the soon coming of Jesus. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Picking up where we left off. Paul was sent out in Acts chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, take them out now and go to Acts chapter 15. We see that the Apostle Paul, along with Barnabas, the very two had, who had contended with those, quote, of the circumcision, against the position that Gentiles were required to be circumcised before they could be saved, it was those very two, Paul and Barnabas, who were sent out. In fact, we read it in Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Bersabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So they sent others with them, but the main emissaries were Paul and Barnabas with this message about the decision of the Jer Jerusalem council. And we pick up the story in Acts chapter 15, verse 30, just a little lower down. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now, let's be clear about what the council's decision actually was, and be clear what it wasn't. If you recall, the issue was not only about circumcision. While circumcision was the main contention, they realized that there were other issues connected with circumcision. There was idolatry, sexual immorality, the eating of unclean meats and blood, and all these different issues that were connected to the ceremonial law. And there were some legitimate concerns about the influx of Gentile believers into the Jewish and now Christian faith, but circumcision was only a false front for those who wanted to keep the Gentiles out and keep the Judaism culturally pure. Now, let me ask this question. The council's decision doesn't mean that someone could be circumcised. Yes, they could still be circumcised if they wanted to. Does it mean that someone must be circumcised? No. Okay. So could they? Yes. Must they? No. So then there's that third question. Should they be circumcised? Well, that depends on the situation. Now think about this. Acts chapter 15 concludes with them going off, and as we just read, they read it to the Gentiles and they rejoiced. But let's go now to Acts chapter 16, the very next passage in Scripture. Verse 1, Then he, and that is Paul, came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Okay, so we have Timothy, who has a Jewish believing mother, but a father who is Greek, and the implication is, as we're going to see in the story, had not consented to his circumcision as a child, so he has not been circumcised. Verse 2, 
He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And notice what he does now. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Now, what in the world is going on? Paul had so valiantly defended the position that Gentile converts do not need to be circumcised in order to be saved. He had taken a lot of heat and a lot of flack for that position. He had taken a lot of discouraging uh, reports against him. A lot of falsehood was generated against Paul and his ministry, but he stood firm on this principle. They do not have to be circumcised. He took that position to the Jerusalem council, and though it started off as the minority opinion, the Holy Spirit intervened, his side, if you want to call them sides, was vindicated. He won. He now has a letter in hand that literally is signed by James and all the other apostles and the leading men and brethren, that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no further burden than these necessary things, none of which was circumcision. He was literally tasked with carrying this letter and delivering it to the new Gentile converts. Yet the very first thing that we see Paul do after the Jerusalem council was to meet Timothy and have him circumcised. Why would he do such a thing? We're going to take a moment and try to dissect and understand the, the methodology of Paul. Paul's approach to ministry. What on earth could he possibly be thinking? Well, let's understand Paul's approach to ministry. We're going to leave our finger here in Acts because it's going to be our home base in a little bit, but we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Paul has to deal with other contentious issues. For instance, he deals with the church in Corinth and he says to them in verse 11, If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So far he hadn't been paid for his ministry. And he says, that's not fair. I'm working. I should get paid. And he goes on to verse 12. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? He has a legitimate concern, but then what does he say? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So he had a legitimate concern, and he could, he could exercise his right and demand, justifiably so, payment for his ministry. But he said, I want you to be aware of the problem, and I also want you to know that I'm not going to demand my rights because I don't want to hinder the gospel. In fact, later on in verse 19, notice what he says in that same chapter. He gives his philosophy of why he would think like this. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as one under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law. And he has to clarify, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. And I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Notice that Paul's methodology in ministry is very pragmatic. It's very practical. His position is simply this. I will remain faithful to God, but as far as I can bend, I will bend to win some. To the Jews, I become a Jew. To the Greeks, I become a Greek. And here, though he has the letter in hand, he refuses to let that be a hindrance to the gospel. Let's look at another example. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just one chapter over. Verse 23. Notice what he says. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Get this. There's things I'm allowed to do that I wouldn't be in trouble for God, with God for doing, but it would hinder the work. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let each, and here's his principle, let no one seek his own, 
but each one the other's well-being. Paul could have demanded his rights. He could have been a real pain about some of these things, and he would have been right in his argumentation. In his theology, he was correct, but his methodology would have fallen short of the practical nature that God wanted it to be. Again, verse 32 and 33 of the same chapter, he writes, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So we understand Paul's approach to ministry, his methodology, his outlook and philosophy. We go back to Acts chapter 16, and it becomes no surprise at all that though he has won the argument about circumcision, the very next thing he would do is circumcise Timothy. And the scripture tells us exactly why. Look again at Acts chapter 16. Verse 3, Paul wanted him to have him go with him. That is Timothy. And he took him and circumcised him. Why? Because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was Greek. Did Paul circumcise Timothy because it was a requirement of the Lord? No. But did Paul circumcise Timothy because it would aid the spread of the gospel to the Jews? Yes. And so Paul sits down, and you can tell, by the way, something about Timothy's Christian maturity. You can imagine the conversation. Paul's like, I want you to come with me. Timothy's like, I'm ready to go. Um, but you know we're going to be encountered by a lot of Jews, and they already have a prejudice against me, and if we keep building these thing up, it's going to be a hurdle to the gospel. And if they find out that you, my point is, though we don't have to, I think we should. And Timothy consents. Watch how the gospel unfolds. Timothy consents. Verse 4, And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem, one of which was that you don't have to be circumcised. But in order for them to hear that you don't have to be circumcised, they had to hear it from someone who was circumcised first. Paul knew the only way to get this message across was to make this messenger acceptable culturally. So he has him circumcised. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Pragmatic. He's trying to win the Jews. So you can imagine as the scripture unfolds here and it, re- it continues to tell the story of the Apostle Paul and his, his missionary journey after the first Jerusalem council, how difficult it must have been when he started to see how often the Jews still were prejudiced against him. Acts chapter 17, starting with verse 1. Now when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, And for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preached to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. Do you notice again? Some Jews were converted, but many Greeks the same issue that had been the problem, the the catalyst to the first Jerusalem council continued afterwards. And so what happens? Chapter uh, 17, verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Notice it was the unbelieving Jews who truly disliked Paul And they were able to leverage their Jewish cultural influence with the believing Jews to keep Paul at arm's distance even from them. It put the believing Jews in a particularly difficult spot. Are you going to go with the culturally Jewish, though unbelieving, friends? Or do you go with the everly increasing Gentile associations, but the faith that you believe is true? They were torn, and many of them chose against the Apostle Paul. It's fascinating. Look at verse 10 here. 
Same chapter, Acts chapter 17. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Watch this line now, verse 13. But the Jews from Thessalonica, where he had previously been, learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea. They came there also and stirred up the crowds. So everywhere Paul went, the people from the previous town who had, had been polarized by his message, the unbelievers or those who were castigating him, who were against his message, would follow him around and harass him and stir up the crowds at the next place as well. Then immediately the brother and sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Paul, Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a man from Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. It goes on now, Acts chapter 18, starting with verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain new Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, and for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. You can imagine Paul is getting quite frustrated with this now. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now look at verse 9. This starts to be an agitation that grows and grows. We're building to the second Jerusalem council. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. God himself had to come down and say, don't worry, it's going to be okay, you just keep preaching. And he stays for a year and a half. Verse 12, when Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment, seeing, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But again, this is not the Roman law they're talking about. They're talking about the law of Moses, the ceremonial law of the Jews. Now watch this. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. So they take him to a Roman guy and say he's broken a Jewish law. And before Paul can even give his defense, which I'm sure would have been quite able, he could have done it well, Gallio himself speaks up and says, wait, 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 you're bringing me a Jewish issue? Verse 15, but if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I, don't not, I do not want to be a judge over such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. So the fascinating thing is that he's getting literally dragged now before secular courts by his Jewish unbelieving countrymen because of his teaching against the law. But he's not saying the law is bad. He's just saying you don't have to ceremonially become a Jew through circumcision for to be a Gentile convert, to be a believer in Christ. Now, Paul planned to visit Jerusalem, then Rome, and finally Spain. Let me show you this in Acts chapter 19, verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he's out. He's been sent out, if you recall, from Jerusalem with the letter in hand. And he's going on this tour to give the good message. And everywhere he goes on this circuit, he's being harassed by Jews, harassed by Jews, harassed by Jews. But now he's saying, look, here's my plan. I'm going to finish this crusade and this campaign. I'm going to go back to Jerusalem and report how things went. 
Then I'm going to go on to Rome. And he has one other stop. He writes to the Romans, by the way, in Romans chapter 15. Let's just hop over there for just a moment. The next book of the Bible. His travel plans beyond Rome. As he writes the book of Romans, anticipating a visit to Rome, he explains his travel plans even further. He writes to them, but now no longer, in Romans 15, 23, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire that the, these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way by, there by you, if I first may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Notice he's saying, he's on his way, he's writing to the Romans before he goes to Rome, while he's still on this journey, saying, I'm going to go first to Jerusalem, give a report of how the Acts 15 council was received, then I'm going to go to Rome and visit you, and from you I hope to get resources to go to Spain. Now let me ask you a question. Did Paul make it to Jerusalem? Yes. We're going to see that in a, sec in a minute, the second Jerusalem council. Did he make it to Rome? Yes, but not as a free man. And did he ever make it to Spain? No. What happened that stopped Paul from his missionary agenda? Again, his, his, his plan was to go back to Jerusalem from which he had been sent, to go from there to Rome, and from Rome to Spain. But what happens? Notice now on his circuit, he's headed back to Jerusalem. And we find in Acts chapter 21, warnings about what would happen in Jerusalem from the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 21. Verse 1, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course from, we came to Kos, and the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So it's Paul's intention. He's been sent out by the brethren in Jerusalem. He wants to go on the circuit and then come back and give a report in route to Rome, eventually going to Spain. But as he's on his way back to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit speaks through individuals telling him very specifically, do not go to Jerusalem. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Verse 5. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. They boarded the ship to keep going to Jerusalem. Let's go to verse 7 now. And when they had finished, we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So he's coming the other way from Judea now and encounters Paul who's headed back to Jerusalem. Notice what he's recorded here. When he, had come down to, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. This is at least the second clear warning from the Holy Spirit that Paul has gotten about this return trip to Jerusalem. The first one is, don't go to Jerusalem, but they're going to keep going. Then Agabus comes and acts out this little parable, taking the, the belt and binding his hands and saying, this is what's going to happen if you go to Jerusalem. 
But what's Paul's response? Verse 12, Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, The will of the Lord be done. Which brings us to the second Jerusalem council. After the Spirit has warned so clearly that this is a bad idea to avoid Jerusalem at all costs. But Paul wanted to win his Jewish brethren. And from the moment he has opened his mouth to preach Jesus, he's had these Jewish detractors harassing and persecuting his ministry, opposing him at every step of the way. So we read in Acts chapter 21, verse 15, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought us with them a certain a nascent of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And notice verse 17. It doesn't sound dire at all. It sounds very good, verse 17. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. I'm sorry, Paul must have been like, ah, all of those warnings, they just didn't know. They, they really love me. We've... We are on good terms now. We, we, we resolved that thing at the First Jerusalem Council. I've, I, I've carried the message that they signed around, and it's going to be fine. And look, they open arms. No problem at all. We continue, though. On the following day, Paul went, into, uh, went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now, pause. Do you recall? Who was the presiding elder the presiding apostle at the first Jerusalem council. It wasn't Peter and it wasn't Paul, it was James. And here is James again with all the elders. Basically, this is the same group of people who were at the first Jerusalem council have reconvened to meet Paul on his way back. The same people that sent him are now receiving him. That's important to notice. Again, verse 18, On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So he gives a report. You sent me out, and here's what happened, and it was a great report. Verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified God. They glorified the Lord. And if it stopped right there, that would be great. But watch what happens now. And by the way, before we get into that, I want to share with you some words from the pen of inspiration about this second Jerusalem council. We read here, this time from Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 209. It was before the same audience at the Apostolic Council, Acts chapter 15, years before, that he related his experience in his conversion and the great work which God had wrought through him among the Gentiles. The Spirit of the Lord then witnessed to the word spoken, and under its influence the Council yielded their prejudices and expressed themselves as in harmony with the position of the Apostle and sent an address to the churches to that effect. But then it has this sentence, but the same battle was again to be fought, the same prejudices once more to be met. Is it possible that the Lord can give you victory over something in your life and then it rear its ugly head and you choose to go back into it? Yes, indeed. We read in Acts of the Apostles, page 401, Several years had passed since the brethren in Jerusalem, with representatives from other leading churches, gave careful consideration to the perplexing questions that had arisen over methods followed by those who were laboring for the Gentiles. As a result of this council, the brethren had united in making definite recommendations to the churches concerning certain rites and customs, including circumcision. 
It was at this general council that the brethren had also united in commending to the Christian churches Barnabas and Paul as laborers worthy of the full confidence of every believer. Among those present at this meeting, that is the first Jerusalem council, were some who had severely criticized the methods of labor followed by the apostles upon whom rested the chief burden of carrying the gospel to the Gentile world. But during the council, their views of God's purpose had broadened, and they had united with their brethren in making wise decisions which made possible the unification of the entire body of believers. So they were converted, or at least broadened in their perspective, at that first Jerusalem council. But watch these words now. Afterward, when it became apparent that the converts among the Gentiles were increasing rapidly, there were a few of the leading brethren at Jerusalem who began to cherish anew their former prejudices against the methods of Paul and his associates. So the same people who had softened their hearts and sent him on his way on the, uh, on the course of Paul's journey, in the time he was away, their hearts rehardened. No wonder the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go back to Jerusalem. Just avoid it altogether. But Paul says, no, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm willing to die if necessary. These prejudices strengthened with the passing of the years until some of the leaders determined that the work of preaching the gospel must henceforth be conducted in accordance with their own ideas. If Paul would conform his methods to certain policies which they advocated, they would acknowledge and sustain his work. Otherwise, they could no longer look upon it with favor or grant it their support. Basically, he's come back to a second Jerusalem council to meet the exact same hearts he had to face at the first Jerusalem council. So we pick up the story again in Scripture, Acts chapter 21, Again in verse 20, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. Sounded good, but then they added this. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Now let me ask you a question that we started off our message with today. Was that the message of Paul? Was that they ought not to be circumcised? No. He was simply preaching that Gentile converts need not be circumcised, and he demonstrated that there are times when it's best to, for expedience of the gospel's sake, in the experience of Timothy, that you should circumcise if the gospel needs it. But he never taught that you shouldn't, that it's bad, that it's... No. But this is the false report that had circulated. And so not only were the Jewish believers in Jerusalem skeptical of Paul, but his own apostle brethren, elders of the churches, had this contention against Paul. So they proposed something. Verse 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet. You know you're going to have to answer this, Paul. For they will hear that you have come. So what are we going to do about this? We've got you here. And of course, what they could have done for is stood up for Paul and defended him. But instead, they propose a compromise. Verse 23, Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. Go through a Jewish ceremonial rite and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. 
demonstrate in your own body that you keep the law. Now, let's pause right here. Paul had had Timothy circumcised to demonstrate his own body, in his own body, a keeping of the law, but it wasn't because he had to. It was solely to be practical in reaching the Jews, to get them to hear the message. But this wasn't necessary to win the Jews to Christ. It was just to tamp down the criticism of Paul, to win friends and influence people, if you will, to please the brethren. But it goes on to say in verse 25, but, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. We're still with you on the Gentile thing, Paul, but you're losing your Jewish support. We need you to show that you're still Jewish. And we need you to at least go through the motions and make it seem as though it's a requirement to keep the law. It's the only way we're going to win them back. Well, what would be wrong with Paul agreeing to the council's decision, the proposal? Anytime he adapted his method of work, it was to reach the target audience. But the proposal now offered by the leading apostles and elders was not for the furtherance of the gospel, but rather for the mere appeasement of the prejudiced Jews. You think back in Christ's own ministry, had he ever provided bread for people to eat? Sure. But when Satan came to his head, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread, he wouldn't budge. Because it wasn't for the furtherance of the gospel, it was to placate an enemy. Here Paul is faced with basically the same decision. Their request basically challenging Paul, if you are a Jew, then do this uniquely Jewish thing in the most prominent Jewish place. While there was nothing inherently wrong with observing a ceremonial vow, because he had attended the feast, he had Timothy circumcised, there's no problem with that. To do so in an attempt to placate judgmental Characters was a disgrace to the cause of Christ. Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 212. The brethren hoped that this act by Paul might give a decisive contradiction to the false reports concerning him. But while James assured Paul that the decision of the former council concerning the Gentile converts and the ceremonial law still held good, the advice given now was not consistent with that decision, which had also been sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God did not prompt this advice. It was the fruit of cowardice. They could have stood up for Paul or thrown him under the bus. And they decided for the latter. Continue reading, we see that the disciples themselves yet cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were too willing to make concessions hoping by so doing to gain the confidence of their countrymen, remove their prejudice, and win them to faith in Christ as the world's Redeemer. Again, notice it's among the disciples here that there's still that prejudice was there. Paul's great object in visiting Jerusalem was to conciliate the Church of Palestine. So long as they continued to cherish prejudice against him, they were constantly working to counteract his influence. He, that is Paul, felt that if he could by any lawful concession on his part win them to the truth, he would remove a very great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede so much as they had asked. This concession was not in harmony with his teachings, nor with the firm integrity of his character. Paul understood that this one was not the pragmatic furtherance of the gospel. This was just a concession, a compromise. He was selling out. When we consider Paul's great desire to be in harmony with his brethren, his tenderness of spirit toward the weak in faith, his reverence for the apostles who had been with Christ, and for James, the brother of the Lord, and his purpose to become all things to all men as far as he could do this and not sacrifice principle, when we consider all this, 
it is less surprising that he was constrained to deviate from his firm, decided course of action. But instead of accomplishing the desired object, these efforts for conciliation only precipitated the crisis, hastened the sufferings of Paul, separated from him from his brethren in his labors, deprived the church of one of its strongest pillars, and brought sorrow to Christian hearts in every land. You see, what happened was Paul consented to this agreement. And instead of pacifying the Jews, this action simply placed him directly in harm's way. Notice what we see in Acts chapter 21. Then Paul, verse 26, took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of the purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. They said that, by the way, verse 29, for they had previously seen Trump, uh, Tr Trophimus and Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. If we had time to go into it, we could, but basically we would find that from this moment on, Paul has little, if any, freedom for the rest of his life. Paul was en route to Rome, but he ends up going to Rome as a prisoner. And from Rome, he never makes it to Spain, his ultimate goal. Now the questions that I would ask is, when Paul was arrested here, he was such a faithful worker. Why didn't the Lord intervene on his behalf as he had with Peter when Peter was arrested? Remember, Peter was beloved of the Jewish believers. He was the popular one, he was the outspoken one, he was, he was one of them, but Paul was seen as an outsider. He was distant. And when Peter was arrested and dragged into prison, immediately the church intervened with prayer on his behalf. But when Paul was arrested, the very ones who had set up this problem abandoned him. His friends didn't rally to, the aid, to his aid and commit themselves to prayer for Paul like they had for Peter. We read in Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 231, the Savior's words of reproof to the men of Nazareth apply in the case of Paul, not only to the unbelieving Jews, but to his own brethren in the faith. Had the leaders in the church fully surrendered their feelings of bitterness towards the apostle and accepted him as one specially called of God to bear the gospel to the Gentiles, the Lord would have spared him to them to still labor for the salvation of souls. Think about what that's saying. If they had bound with him, if they had stood with their brother, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, and bound their hearts together and lifted him up in prayer, the Lord would have spared him. We continue reading. He who sees the end from the beginning and who understands the hearts of all saw what would be the result of the envy and jealousy cherished towards Paul. Listen to this powerful statement. When you hear it the first time, and it did for me, it just rocked me on my heels. God had not in his providence ordained that Paul's labor should so soon end. But he did not work a miracle to counteract the train of circumstances to which their own course gave rise. It was not God's intention for Paul's work to be stopped as it was. Mm. Now think about the implications of if Paul had had the support of his church brethren 
And then instead of throwing him under the bus, they stood shoulder to shoulder and prayed for him, lift him up, lifting him up in intercessory prayer. What if instead of compromising, they stood confident with him? And Paul could have gone from there unabated to Rome. And from there, Rome got the support to go to Spain. What would have happened with the church? We don't know. But we do know that it was not God's idea that his work should be so stopped then. Concluding the counsel on this story, we read, the same spirit is still leading to the same results. A neglect to appreciate and improve the provisions of divine grace has deprived the church of many a blessing. How often would the Lord have prolonged the life of some faithful minister had his labors been appreciated? But if the church permit the enemy of souls to pervert their understanding so that they misrepresent and misinterpret the words and acts of the servant of Christ, if they allow themselves to stand in his way and hinder his usefulness, the Lord removes from them the blessing which he gave. Friends, it is my prayer that we learn the lessons of the early church as we seek to be God's last day church, looking forward and hastening the coming of Christ. And I think of the usefulness that Paul could have been to the cause of Christ in those days, and I think, as inspiration has told us about the application in our day, is it possible that there is more that the Lord would do through others, but we are not holding them up in prayer? Is it possible that our lack of Christian unity, our lack of harmonious action, is impeding the cause of Christ, and instead of hastening the coming of Christ, is actually delaying the coming of Christ? Is it possible that the very lessons recorded in Scripture are for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come? Friends, let me close with this appeal. There may be problems in the church, I have no doubt about it. There may be issues upon which you disagree and violently oppose, but let me tell you something. The devil wants to divide and conquer, but Christ wants to unite his people under the banner of salvation. If you have a grievance against a brother or sister in the faith or some minister, some worker in the cause of God, please do not allow Satan the victory and go around backbiting and undermining and sweeping away their influence in some self-righteous quest of your own, but instead prayerfully, humbly lift the brother or sister up in the Lord. Pray for them. Even if they're, out of their, if, even if they're wrong, like hold them up, counsel with them, plead with them, beseech with them, walk with them, work with them, talk with them. But don't abandon them. Don't leave them on the battlefield alone. But friends, we need to lift each other up in prayer. We need to hold firm to the message that God has given. And each one of us needs to learn the lessons from Scripture the Holy Spirit wants to write on our hearts. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you again for these challenging words of Scripture. It's so easy to glibly run by the book of Acts and say, oh, they were all of one accord and there was unity in the church. But Lord, we see that the problem with the early church is the problem with the last day church. It's chock full of people. And each one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Lord, so now we humbly ask your forgiveness. Please, Lord, correct our defects of character. And if there's any dispute or dissension, any kind of discord within your body, Lord, help us to be agents of peace and healing. Help us to intercede for those who are weak and falling or those who are strong and pushing forward your truth in unentered areas. Lord, help us not to have a critical spirit but to have a Christ-like spirit. Help us to pray as we've never prayed before and help us to work as we've never worked before so that the world may see the likeness of God when they see his followers on earth. Bless us, Lord. Keep us faithful and make us your servants for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.